So thank you everybody for joining, especially Alex. It's good to see you again, even though you're a little square on my screen. Um, so I'll just start with an introduction of the committee um, work and I'll, I'll list off the committee members and then I'll turn it over to you, Alex, to introduce yourself and your organization. And then we can just start jumping into discussion. Does that work for everybody? Awesome. All right, so for everybody online, um, welcome to an information gathering session for the Committee on Ocean Acoustics Education and Expertise. We've had multiple information gathering sessions on other topics, um, higher ed education, ocean acoustics education, early career folks, and I'm missing one, workforce development. And so, um, we had one on outreach also, and Alex, you weren't able to attend that that general outreach meeting. So we wanted to make some time to speak with you individually because you come from a sector and organization that wasn't represented on the outreach information gathering panel. So that's sort of the background and us wanting to pick your brain about what is going well and what we could do better as a community in terms of ocean acoustics outreach from an energy sector perspective. Um, so that's really the background of why we're all, we're all here today. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jen Mixes Olds. I'm the chair of the committee um, and I am from the University of New Hampshire where I am the director for the Center for Acoustics Research and Education. In order to be um, brief, I'm just gonna run down the names and affiliations of the different committee members. We've got Andrea Anguelas from Penn State University, Art Baggerer from MIT, Lisa Hodling from Eidos Education, Wu Zhang Li from the University of Washington, Carolyn Rupo from USGS, Gail Scowcroft from the University of Rhode Island, and Preston Wilson from the University of Austin, Texas. Um, most of our committee members are online today, and this is being recorded for both the public and for other committee members that aren't online. So if you don't see someone's little face in a square right now, they will have access to this video a little bit later. Um, Alex, I think you've already been presented the statement of task for this particular committee. And outreach really falls into number four, exploring strategies to one, raise the profile and value um, of careers in ocean acoustics, including education, training, workforce development, recruitment, and retention. And so um, we're really going to focus on those sort of outreach topics today, not um, research. And then that was the only other slide I had. So I just wanted to keep this, I'll leave this up there for just a minute or two so other people can read it um, from the public. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn this over to you, Alex, for an introduction of you and your organization. Do you have slides to share? I do, yes. Okay, then let me stop sharing. There we go. All right, let me see. Let me share that. And hopefully you'll get the right screen. If not, please do let me know. Too many monitors. Yeah, I know, I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I just moved, so I have reconfigured my entire desk and now I'm trying to figure out my setup once again. Oh my goodness, okay. Hold on, let me start over. <laughs> We're just limited. However, if you just get to slide view, if you don't want to do presenter, we can still see your slides perfectly from before. This should work. Do we have it now? Nope. Just you. Huh. I guess I have to click share if I oh, want to share. There you huh? get perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I am. Um, my family just moved up to Wisconsin this last weekend. And so we're still kind of figuring out the uh, the ins and outs of our desk setups because we've just been back to work for a few days. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you making time for me. Um, I was on parental leave while we had the last meeting. And so the, the next generation of women in science is currently in daycare. Um, so I really appreciate you having some time for me this morning. 
Um, I am the scientific director for the Energeo Alliance. Um, some of you may be familiar with us in our previous iteration of as the IAGC. Um, we rebranded to the Energeo Alliance in 2022, um, just to update the name of the organization to something that better aligned with what we actually do. IAGC had become somewhat outdated. Um, so we are the Global Trade Alliance for the energy geoscience industry. So our focus is on the exploration activities that come prior to any sort of energy development. Um, what makes Energeo unique from some of the other energy geoscience trade associations is that we have, number one, a global focus. So we work all over the world, in country, wherever we're needed. Um, and we also are the only organization that has a full-time scientist on staff in order to advise on issues related to the environment and specifically sound in the marine environment. Our governing members you may be familiar with, so these are the organizations that conduct offshore seismic surveying in whatever form that may take. And we also work closely with the broader energy industry, so here you see our industry partners. Um, primarily, our focus has been hydrocarbon development, but we are also beginning to branch out working with some of the offshore wind development. And our intent is to also focus on carbon capture as that gets on board in the U.S. So anywhere that there's geoscience involved, Energeo is engaged. Um, I like to show this graphic when I talk to groups because I think it's important to emphasize that energy in whatever form it looks like right now generally involves something going into, out of, or through the ground. And if that is something that we need to do, then there is a geoscience component involved. And I think it's quite obvious it's a short step from geoscience into a need for um, a strong foundation in acoustics. So um, this is really something that's going to continue to be a challenge. 40% um, of the world does not have access to clean fuels for cooking. And 13% of the world does not have access to energy or electricity at all as of right now. Um, so I think it's easy for us to take it for granted sitting here in the Western Hemisphere, the lights come on when we hit the switch. Um, but really energy access is one of the most important um, aspects of lifting communities out of poverty, providing access to education. And that energy need is going to continue to increase. So by 2050, we're expecting total energy use to increase by about 50%. And that means that we need to look into a mix of energy resources, whether that includes natural gas, hydrocarbons, nuclear, renewables, other alternatives. Um, and of course, carbon capture is going to be a part of that, too, in order to offset some of those emissions. So the reason why I'm so focused on um, acoustics and the importance of education is that we need to have folks that are able to look at a graphic like this. Um, this is a seismic survey signal, a single pulse. And look at that and say, okay, what does it mean for a graphic like this? Um, these are two sectors that generally do not talk to each other very often. So we need to be able to translate the acoustics piece and the propagation of sound in the aquatic environment and the potential impacts to marine life. And so that is somewhere where there is, there's quite a gap right now and we're not seeing um, a focus on education in that of specific areas. So I know for me, I had a, a background in fisheries and in marine mammal behavior, um, but I learned a lot of the acoustics on the job. And so I think given, you know, we've seen that the increase in energy demand is coming, we've seen that the increase in global population is coming, um, there's a real opportunity here to include that acoustics education piece and also the environmental education piece. And um, those two communities have struggled to speak the same language at times, and that really makes it difficult for us to accomplish what we need to accomplish as a scientific community, but also as an industry. And so I'm very pleased to see that there is a focus with this committee um, on that. And then I guess I'll just leave it there and we can jump into any questions and discussion. Awesome, thank you very much, Alex. Um, do you wanna to continue to share your slides so you refer back to them or do you wanna stop sharing so we, we can-, can We can probably stop it. I can pop them up again if you need them. All right, so I could start us off and then um, committee members might have other questions that they want to ask specifically, um, either on a different topic of outreach and education or training or following up on what I ask. So, um, yes, I, I, I continually want to call it IAGC. So I'm trying to make that, <laughs> make that transition. It took me about a year to get there, so I can totally understand. <laughs> so as you are well aware, acoustics is a highly interdisciplinary topic. And so outreach is is quite interesting because as you said, you did a lot of on the job training and learning in order to um, do your job well. And so I was wondering, what does your organization or, or is there anything that your organization does to target outreach opportunities 
um, knowing that this is interdisciplinary. So where do you go for that? And what do you feel um, has been most successful for your organization in reaching a broad audience in a highly, highly, highly interdisciplinary area? Even if it's That's not a, ocean acoustics related, you may have a really good example for something not ocean acoustics related at all, but still a great outreach strategy. And we're definitely wanting to learn from other interdisciplinary topics that may be doing outreach in ways that we can learn things from. Yeah, I think one of the most important lessons I've learned doing this job, I've been here for about five years, is that you don't win friends with science. Um, that can be a tough pill to swallow for those of us who like to have the facts and the figures and see the numbers. Um, but the reality is the vast majority of the general public is kind of put off when they, they're they bombarded with information that they don't understand. And so being a good translator is really critical to ensuring that folks are, are engaged and interested. So we are typically not engaged at the academic level. Our focus is more on engaging with the general public. Um, so the majority of the outreach that we do relates to um, community engagement and government engagement. Um, we've seen governments all over the world, the, the capacity for understanding acoustics and understanding the effects on the environment varies greatly. We'll see areas like the US, areas like Australia, a um, number of places in the EU where uh, regulators are very competent. They understand this. Um, they have folks on staff who are acousticians. And then there are other places that are developing countries. I'm actually headed to Uruguay next month where they don't necessarily have a firm background in how the acoustics and environment pieces interact. And so I think that's been the most important part for us is ensuring that we're meeting people where they are and providing that engagement on a level that's appropriate for the audience. And so the way that we'll talk to a government regulator that's well-versed in acoustics and environmental impacts is gonna be very different from the way that we'll talk with the general public. Um, another piece of that, too, is also ensuring that we're getting out and having these public facing conversations. So whether that might mean, you know, we're we're supporting um, a general outreach meeting, we're actually stepping into those public engagement meetings. Um, it might mean that we're doing things like documentary or news interviews to provide some foundation and some facts. Um, I think the most important piece for reaching students, though, is that people just don't know that these opportunities exist. I certainly didn't know when I was a graduate student. And that's that's a message that I try to drive home whenever I talk to graduate students now is that it's just not sufficient to be good at one thing anymore. Um, our field has just become increasingly interdisciplinary. And so if you can marry those two pieces and have that background in acoustics, but also the environmental piece, that makes you a really attractive prospect for job opportunities. And as we start looking into the future, when we have more environmental impact reviews to conduct, um, more of these types of public engagement meetings, and we need scientists who can act as translators, who can say, okay, you know, yes, I understand the technical specifics, but I can also bring that to a level that the general public can understand. That puts you in a really powerful position as a scientist to be an advocate for um, an industry that's going to be increasingly important as we move forward. Awesome. Thank you. You echoed one of um, the same sort of um, areas where we need to do better, which is you called it translators, uh, a previous outreach uh, information gathering panel um, conversation called it science communications. And so it's, it's really the same thing, you know, translating that. And you had a great point where people are at their level. And that's important. Um, so your, uh, your answer reinforces the answer that we continue to, to hear other committee members, questions. Carolyn has her hand up. Go ahead, Carolyn. Hi, uh, Alex. Thanks for that overview. Um, I, uh, besides my science at the USGS, I do all of our marine compliance um, and work with NSF extensively on the seismic component. So some of what you guys encounter are, <laughs> are the same issues that we encounter. So that that actually, you started to actually allude to this in, in what you were saying. You were talking about this different kind of outreach, which is the outreach to the public to help them understand without getting into the science, the facts behind things. Things. One thing that has concerned us, and I, I was an academic for a long time, has concerned us in the community for a long time is that doing active acoustics work, I mean, it's always constantly seems threatened to the people who are involved in it and the for the students. So, you know, even 20 years ago, PhD students were saying, why should I do this? Because 
<laughs> everyone's trying to shut me down, right? Yeah. So one thing I'd like to ask you is, um, in terms of the kinds of outreach that can both help, I'm not trying to get a job security issue here, but I'm saying we do need acquisitions and people are afraid their work is getting shut down. It, it, instead of being reactive, I guess one thing be interesting to hear from you is how one can be proactive with outreach about what ocean acoustics is about, how it's important, et cetera, and the timing of that and sort of some of the strategies. So A, we don't get shut down and and B, you know, we can further what mankind needs with with while respecting the environment. Yeah, thanks for that question, Carolyn. That's that's certainly one of those places where, you know, I, I'm sure on your side working and trying to ensure that you have access to those authorizations, it can feel like everyone's trying to shut you down. For me, working on the regulatory side, I call that job security. <laughs> and that is one of those places where, you know, the community is just there's there's a lack of information and there's also an abundance of misinformation about what acoustics is. Um, I, I love that you use the word proactive. That's been my buzzword since I started at Energio. Um, I actually put the word proactive into a name of a program that we launched a couple of years ago because that's something I've been trying to reinforce with this industry. Um, I think for, for a number of years, we've seen the energy industry be highly reactive. Um, there was this impression of, well, we're going to do what we need to do, and it's okay if people don't like it, and we're just not going to get out there in the public and expose ourselves to risk. And that's still something we see, particularly with the large energy operators, is they are extremely risk averse. They don't want that exposure. And so that's where organizations like Energio come in. Um, we really view our, our objective as being those science communicators for the broader community that, you know, those, those companies that maybe aren't willing to take those risks have some cover. Um, but also that they can point to an expert. Um, I, you know, it, it is a challenge because we're living in a society right now where we're seeing kind of this depth of expertise. There's a mistrust of scientists and experts. Um, but the other challenge is is working with some of these environmental NGOs that are willing to um, promulgate, let's call it misinformation or disinformation, um, in order to meet whatever those end objectives might be. So we see quite a lot of misinformation around what seismic surveys are because that's, you know, that's the easiest way to shut down energy development. You shut down exploration, energy development follows very quickly behind it. Um, so we'll see comments like um, seismic blasting is louder than, you know, whatever air, airplane taking off, you know, it's and it's just incorrect. It's simply just incorrect. And so that's one of the most important places where I think the scientific community needs to get engaged is we need to be the ones that are out there in the community. We need to recognize that we are going to have to have some hard conversations. We are going to have to talk to people that we don't agree with. Um, but a focus for me in this role is really building bridges with some of those organizations. So trying to sit down at the same table with people that we don't agree with and have a conversation. Um, that collaborative mindset has been very constructive in the past. And of course, you know, there are always people who just are, are not going to be interested in hearing what you have to say, and you have to be comfortable with living with that. Um, but the more that we have that collaborative and interdisciplinary mindset, I think the more constructive we can be. But it, it certainly is a challenge. Um, and actually, Energio has a, a communications, a public outreach campaign launching, I think, next month. Um, and it's going to be called Energy Starts With Me. And so the focus is going to be kind of humanizing the energy geoscience workforce. It's actually going to be interviewing folks that are engaged in those projects day to day, focusing on why we believe that energy access is so important to ensuring that the world has you know, a, a high standard of living, um, how we do this to ensure that it's done in an environmentally sustainable and safe way. Um, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I'm I'm a marine biologist. I didn't go to graduate school for all of those years to try and kill whales and dolphins with the seismic survey. If I thought that's the way that this worked, I wouldn't be here. Um, so my job is to ensure that we're doing this in the most environmentally sustainable way for the long term. But I also consider myself a pragmatist. And that means sometimes, you know, we have to have these hard conversations around, look, oil and gas is going to be a part of the energy mix. That's just a reality. And I frankly, I would personally rather it be coming from somewhere like the US Gulf of Mexico, where it's tightly regulated, um, emissions are low per barrel, rather than importing from the Middle East. And so these are the types of conversations we have to have. It can be a challenge for sure, because these are not, you know, these are not sound bites about seismic blasting, killing the whales. Um, we're starting to see some of that rhetoric off of the East Coast as well, related to offshore wind. 
Um, and so really just that education piece and being willing to have those tough conversations is what's going to be most important in the future. I love that you identified that one of the outreach components that we may not have highlight, highlighted or identified in previous outreach information sessions is the sectors or the, the um, discussions where people don't agree um, with ocean, the ocean acoustic community. And so that that's a really important part of outreach that, again, thank you for highlighting that. That's not something that usually comes into my mind when I think about outreach. I think of students and the public and so forth, but not people who oppose that topic. So that's that's an important sector um, or component of outreach that often gets overlooked that we're gonna make sure that we have to capture in our outreach session. Yeah, it can be tempting to slip into that echo chamber of I'm talking to people who get it, you know, you kind of understand. But the reality is some of those conversations that I've had with people that I strongly disagree with have been some of the most productive conversations that I think I've ever had, you know, and it's it's important, I think. And, and there's a slip away from having those kinds of conversations and having a mutual respect with people that you don't agree with on a scientific basis. And I think that's where our community can really set an example of, look, we can we can disagree, we can still be civil, we can still get along, and we can still work towards constructive solutions. And so I think the more that we can emphasize those conversations and share that with the public, the more positive the overall outcome will be for everyone. Yeah, that's a, a form of uh, outreach we, we don't often hear, and it really moves in nicely to the next topic, it's outreach related to DEI because that that outreach with people you don't agree with is a form of diversity in your outreach, going outside what's comfortable. So I, I kind of like that that sort of role into the DEI effort of outreach. Any other com, um, committee member questions? I know we don't have a whole, we have about four minutes. Oh my gosh, we're just talking about. Um, <laughs> well, I think on the DEI front, I just want to emphasize again, the importance of mentorship. Um, I have been incredibly fortunate. I have had wonderful female mentors at every stage of my career, and I would not be here if it weren't for them. And so I, I think, you know, if we all have that mentality of a community as look, once I get a leg up, my first priority is to turn around and reach a hand back down, um, making time to mentor those who are coming up and learning is is just so critical because having a mentor that understands where you're coming from, understands the challenges that you're facing. Um, for me, it was partly as you know a woman in science coming up as a young woman. It was in into an industry that's heavily male dominated. That that was a challenge, and so having people who have been through it um, to talk through some of those questions is is incredibly useful. And so I would just encourage, even if it's not necessarily a formal mentorship program. Um, having those conversations with with students is incredibly important. Yep. Um, Preston, I'm going to give you the last question here. Oh, Let's thank you. Um, that was a great um, set of slides. I really enjoyed seeing like, okay, here's the sound field and here's the hearing thresholds, thinking about mapping those over. So I think it was a good example. <clears throat> My question um, is about kind of a specific kind of outreach. So, um, are, are you all trying to um, kind of find people who want to make these processes better for the environment? Is that part of your outreach? So, you know, let me, let me make a finer description of what I'm asking. You know, there, there are ways we could potentially mitigate environmental concerns by modifying like surveys and other things that we do to kind of minimize exposure while still getting the information we want. So are you all trying to find people who would not have normally wanted to work, say, in seismic surveys, but if they can do so to improve, uh, minimize the environmental impact, th they might. Is that something you guys try to do? Does yeah, thanks sense? for that question, Preston. That's that's a really good one to, to end on, I think. So we haven't been super engaged in finding people that don't want to work in seismic and trying to encourage them to come in. Um, but a piece that we have been focused on for sure is ensuring that our membership understands the importance of environmental stewardship. 
Um, we have a comprehensive environmental impact assessment guide that we published. It's about 450 pages and it walks through how to minimize or mitigate potential impacts from surveys um, step by step, basically. So I think that's where um, sometimes there's this confusion of, well, we're just going to do whatever we need to do and that's all that matters. But the focus is always on, look, if you can separate the sound source from the from the receiver, that's always the best option. And so if we know that there's an, a time that there's a sensitive population there, um, we try and plan around that. It may not always be possible because it may be, you know, there's there's operational reasons that you can't work in a certain season. Um, but that's always the preference is minimize those interactions as, mu as much as possible. And so I think that's where as a community, we can focus on um, sharing that that is something that we do because I think maybe there's a perception that that's not how this works. Um, but I think if we can share that with the public that, you know, this is something that our industry prioritizes and we understand the need for minimizing interactions, for providing these um, comprehensive, in-depth mitigation measures, and also recognizing that planning is the most important step of mitigation, that in the field mitigation is the last resort. Um, if we're able to plan around certain sensitive periods, then that's always going to be the preference. And so I think our industry could do a better job of, of championing what we are already doing to encourage folks who maybe are, are hesitant or thinking that that's not something that's happening to participate in those conversations with us. Thank you. Um, before I finish up, Alex, do you have any last thoughts that you want to share with the committee? Oh gosh, no pressure. <laughs> I have, I have, have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> no. um, you know, I would just like to end on the note of it's it's encouraging to see that this is something that's being taken up. This is something that I have been struggling with recently. Um, I'm looking to bring on a, a new hire to so somebody who can support me because I just do not have enough hours in the day. Um, but right now I'm a department of one and that skill set can be extremely difficult to find somebody who understands the acoustics well enough and who understands the environment well enough to speak both languages and work both ways. But then there's also a personality piece that comes into it. Um, and so I think that focus on those interpersonal skills, those soft skills, learning to build relationships is something that we really need to encourage in our student populations. Um, I know as a student, I was so averse to networking and there's still a part of me that goes, ah, too much socializing. Um, but building those relationships is really how you build rapport. And from there, you can have those constructive conversations. And so emphasizing that with our student community is going to be really important moving forward. Thank you. Um, I want to finish up too and say, if you, if something comes into your mind to later while you're driving home or so forth, please drop an email to myself or any of the committee members um, that we will share amongst the committee. Um, so in case you, something like pops into your head that you're like, oh, I forgot this, please don't hesitate to uh, let us know. And um, if there is any literature that you could point us to within your organization that you can say, hey, you know, this has really been one of our biggest successful outreach campaigns or efforts or material. Um, anything that we can have that we can share and archive for the committee um, would be fantastic. Um, Absolutely. Be Let me get with our communications director on that because we have lots of public resources that I think might be valuable. That would be great. And um, we'll take the time to look at those and at least ma make them available to the public. In addition to the written report that we write, there is a, an archive of materials for, for the public. Um, all Everything we do, everything we collect is publicly available. And so anything that you have that could be helpful in, um, in this endeavor, we, we greatly appreciate you sharing it. And um, I very much thank you for your time. I love talking to you all the time. You, you guys, um, definitely have a wide sector of people that you reach both in the industry and outside the industry. So I very much appreciate you spending this time with us today. Thanks so much, Jen. The feeling's mutual. And if anybody has questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. It's just aglorero at energyalliance.org. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Alex. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.